Chapter Five of the Silver Bullet by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Theory of Mrs. Marsh. For the next week or so, Herrick had his hands full. Mrs. Marsh grew rapidly worse, and several times nearly slipped through his fingers. But the doctor's skills, Petronella's nursing, and above all, the indomitable determination of Mrs. Marsh not to die enabled her to turn the corner. She became much better, but still suffered from racking pains. At times, Herrick gave her morphia, but did so sparingly. From Petronella he learned that she had taken chloral for years past, and feared that if she gained a taste for morphia, she might take to it instead of the weaker drug. For Stephen's sake, Jim could not let that happen. Never had Herrick had so unruly a patient. He did not wonder that she had quarreled with all the Beelminster doctors. The wonder was that she had a friend left. Her temper was ungovernable, and she fought Herrick on every point that did not chime in with her inclinations. In spite of the fact he was attending her out of sheer kindness, and had intimated to Stephen that he expected no fee, Mrs. Marsh abused him virulently whenever she felt so inclined. But then she abused everyone, even Petronella, who was her slave. As to Stephen, devoted as he was to her, she could not find words bad enough for him sometimes. He was a fool, a ninny, a milksop. He lived upon her charity, etc., etc., Yet there were times when the young man was all that was good in her eyes. Even Herrick came in for a share of praise at odd moments. Grand deal, Petronella would say to Herrick, after some tussle, was there ever such a divola as the padrona? The old Italian woman had taken a great fancy to Dr. Jim. He was good to her mistress, whom she idolized. He was kind to Petronella herself, and could speak her language. He had once made a tour of Europe for three years with a young dipsomaniac, and had contrived to pick up three or four tongues, which he spoke remarkably correctly. Spanish, French, German, Italian. Dr. Jim knew them all, and could both read and write them with wonderful accuracy. In the eyes of Petronella, he was a marvelous man, and she often talked to him on subjects which she would not discuss with anyone else. Do not be angry with a padrona, Signor Doctore, she said sometimes. It is the blood of the Michelotto family, ah? Eh? The Michelotti were wicked. Like Colonel Carr, eh, Petronella? Signor Doctore, the Colonel was an angel of light to the wicked Michelotti. The padrona is the last of them, and it is not wonder she is angry. Per Bacco, added Petronella who could swear on occasions. See this casa, a fitting casa for the last of the Grand Signori. But it is all right now, Petronella. As soon as your Signora can be removed, we shall take her to the Pines. That is a fine casa, if you like. Petronella spat and shook her white elf locks. It will bring no luck. Ah, Signor, but that man had the evil eye. Once I went with a padrona to see him. He overlooked me, although I made horns, and I hurt my foot. If my padrona goes to that casa, she will die. Herrick shrugged his shoulders and did not argue. There was no means of persuading Petronella out of the spite she had taken to the pines. It was now the property of Stephen Marsh. The senior partner of Firth and Firth had come down personally with the will. This left Stephen the house on condition that he pulled down the tower. Furthermore, the personal property of the late colonel, amounting to eight thousand a year well invested, was given to the young man on a still more curious condition. "'You are to have a special vault constructed in Saxon churchyard,' said Mr. Firth. "'It is to be built of stone and lined with sheet iron. The body of our late client is to be put in there, and you alone are to hold the key of the door. Once a month you are to enter the vault and see that the body is safe. 
If you do this for a year, then the property becomes yours absolutely. If you miss going once, the money goes to Frisco. To Frisco, the Colonel's servant, said Stephen in surprise. And by that name, Mr. Firth? Yes, it is legal enough. But the man evidently murdered his master and has gone away to avoid consequences. I do not think you will be troubled by him. Also, Mr. Marsh, or rather Mr. Carr, since you have to take the name, you can avert all chance of this man getting the money by visiting the vault monthly for a year. Here was another mystery. Why the money should have been left to Frisco, no one could guess. Stephen often talked it over with Herrick, but could come to no conclusion. However, he set to work to carry out the terms of the will. A body of workmen were employed to take down the tower, and Mr. Corn was seen about the construction of a new vault. Evidently the Colonel did not consider his remains would be safe in the ancestral burial place. In spite of all secrecy, the countryside came to know of this strange provision of Carr's will, and it was said that he wanted to make sure that his body would not be carried off by the devil to whom he had sold himself. In fact, the general opinion was that some night the remains would be carried off like those of the old woman of Berkeley. The villagers grew confused over the matter, and did not distinguish between the body and soul. While Mrs. Marsh was slowly getting better, and Stephen was attending to the carrying out of the will, Dr. Jim remained at Saxham, or rather, for the sake of his patient, he lived at Beerominster, paying occasional visit to the village. Robin had long since returned to London, and had left in much anger at Jim's refusal to accompany him. "'You have found a new friend,' he said angrily, "'and I must go to the wall.' I do call it unfair, Jim. My dear Robin, I cannot be your shadow. You are quite well able to look after yourself now. I took you for this walking tour to do you good. Now you are in excellent health. I must remain here until Mrs. Marsh is quite well. Remember, if I go, she has no doctor to attend her. I can't do without you, persisted Robin. You have such an influence over me that I am lost if you are away. You must take up your life on your own shoulders, replied Herrick impatiently. It is no use relying on other people. But if you feel that I am so indispensable to you, why not stay here? You have money, no ties. You can do your work here better than in London. I want to go back to town. If I stay here, I shall not see much of you. Marsh is your friend now. I like Marsh. He's a good fellow and I can make something of him. I suppose, Robin, you think I'm after his money, but you know me better than that. The three hundred a year I have is enough for me. I was never a man for luxury. I never thought or hinted such a thing, said Joyce, with a blush. Well, if you like to stay here, Jim, I'll return to London, and we can meet when you return. I suppose you'll be back some time. That is, if Miss Endicott will let you go. "'Nonsense,' replied Dr. Jim. "'She has no thought of me. "'I like her very much, but in my present state of poverty "'I could not ask her to be my wife.' "'Joyce said nothing more, but the next week took his leave. "'He was much missed in Saxon, "'where his bright talk and merry face had made him a general favorite. "'The Biffs especially were sorry. "'Bess had foregathered with Joyce on the common ground of literature and she lamented when he departed. "'Why can't you stay here?' she said in her blunt way. "'You can work better in the country.' "'No, Miss Bess, I'm like Charles Lamb. London is my home. I cannot get enough of the divine fire in this tame locality.' "'There's nothing tame about it,' cried Bess, fired with indignation. Joyce laughed, not to you, perhaps, but I prefer London myself. However, I hope you will let me come down and see you at times, and we can correspond, and if you have any manuscripts you think well of, send them to me. I will see what I can do with them. This arrangement was made, and Robin, taking a friendly leave of Jim, went back to his West Kensington fiat. 
He wrote frequently at first, but after a time his letters became rarer. Herrick was sorry, but on the whole somewhat relieved to be rid of such a burden, for Robin was one of those people who are delightful to meet and terrible to live with. Had he been ill or in trouble, the conscientious Jim would have stayed with him. But since he had been particularly well after that attack of nerves, when the body was discovered, there was no necessity for Herrick to martyrize himself further. And besides, Jim had fallen seriously in love with Ida Endicott. When Mrs. Marsh was fairly on the road to recovery, Stephen had taken Jim over to Saxon and had introduced him to the Biffs. They lived in a tumbled-down house of considerable size, down a deep and leafy lane. At one time the Endicotts had been great folks, but the late Mr. Endicott, who had married the daughter of an earl, had squandered the revenues of the family. His wife, Lady Arabella, had died of sheer worry, and Mr. Endicott had found himself alone with five children and an impoverished estate. For a time he did his best to keep things together, but ultimately died, as it was said, of a broken heart. It seemed probable that the five children would go on the parish. What a fall for the haughty Endicott! It was at this juncture that Lord Gartham stepped in. He was an Irish peer and poor himself, but he could not see his sister's children entirely penniless. Ida was the eldest at twenty-four when her father died. Bess had reached the age of twenty-three, and Sidney, the youngest, was sixteen. The five Endicotts were all handsome and had high spirits, but poorer than the proverbial church mouse. What was to be done? We'll earn our own living, said Bess, who was the most energetic of the five. Ida can look after the house, Frank can manage the farm, and Sidney can go to school. And I shall ask Mr. Arch to take me on to the Weekly Chronicle. But, my dear child, expostulated the Earl. What does it matter, cried Bess? We are the Endicotts, whatever we may do. Everybody knows who we are and what we are. There is nothing disgraceful in earning our own living, Uncle Gar. The Earl, rather a helpless person, who had never done a stroke of honest work in his life, was rather surprised at the energy of Bess. However, her scheme recommended itself to his favor, since there was absolutely no other way of settling the matter. In one way or another, Lord Gartham paid off the debts by selling some of the land and arranged that the United Five should have a small income with which they had to increase as best they could. Thus it was that the Endicotts found themselves with their ancestral home, a small farm, two hundred a year, and the world before them. They were all young and hardy, so they thought very little of the matter. Bess obtained a post on the Weekly Chronicle at Beerminster. Ida looked after the house, and Frank managed the farm. Flo was put to a Beelminster school when she returned once a week to Saxon, and Sidney studied under Mr. Corn, who expressed a desire to take him. The countryside all approved of this independent spirit and made much of the Biffs. When the Colonel died, this had been going on for three years. Ida was still unmarried, as she had refused several offers. I cannot leave the children, she said, and people were divided as to the wisdom of this attitude. Some said it was right, but the majority agreed that it was a pity such a beautiful girl should develop into an old maid. But the fact is no one knew Ida's secret. She was in love with Stephen, and although they had never spoken on the subject, they understood one another very well. Hitherto, Stephen's poverty had prevented him from speaking openly. Now the inheritance of eight thousand a year had altered all that, and he intended to ask Ida to be his wife on the very earliest opportunity. It was a pity Jim did not know of this. He had fallen in love with Ida, and as she was always pleasant to him, it never crossed his mind that her heart was engaged. Open on most points with his new friend, Stephen, out of delicacy for Ida, was reticent about his love. 
So Jim continued to live in a fool's paradise, and not even the sharp-eyed Joyce had been able to enlighten him. Certainly Mrs. Marsh had spoken to Jim on the subject. She wanted Stephen to marry Miss Endicott, but Dr. Herrick thought that was merely her own desire, and did not think there was anything serious between the young people. Nor could Mrs. Marsh inform him of more than the fact that they liked one another, and that it was the desire of her heart to see them married. One day when Stephen was at Saxham, Mrs. Marsh had a long talk with the doctor, in which he saw more of her stormy character than had ever been shown to him before. She could sit up in bed now, and wearied of the society of Petronella, frequently asked Herrick to stay beside her. "'You are one of the few sensible men I have met,' she said, drawing her black brows together. "'Come and talk. I want you to tell me what you think of Stephen.' "'What can I think but that he is the best of fellows?' replied Jim, taking a chair by the bedside. "'Hm, that sounds like the weakest of men. Stephen, I mean. You are strong enough in every way. That is why I want you to look after Stephen.' "'How do you mean look after him, Mrs. Marsh?' The widow mused for a time before replying. "'He is a good-hearted fool,' she said at last, "'and with his sweet nature is likely to be imposed upon in this world. Now he is rich and scoundrels will prey on him. I want you to see that he comes to no harm.' "'But I have to return to London,' remonstrated Jim, rather taken aback by the responsibility thrust upon him. I am not a rich man, Mrs. Marsh, and I must look after my practice. I can arrange all that, she replied sharply. You are a good man, Dr. Herrick. I can see that, and I'm no fool. All your influence over Stephen will be for good. I can get him to offer you some inducement to stay beside him, at all events, until he is married. Until he is married, echoed Jim, puzzled. Has he any intention of getting married? not that I know of. He is too much wrapped up in his poetry. But I wish him to marry Ida Endicott. She is a well-born girl and a good woman. I think she will make Stephen an excellent wife. She likes him. Jim felt the blood flush in his face. Like it is not love, he said in a rather irritated tone. Mrs. Marsh pulled the curtain aside so that the light fell on the face of the young man. Then, after a scrutiny, she gave a short laugh. "'So that's is it, is it?' she said. "'You are in love with a girl.' "'I never said so, Mrs. Marsh. Pshaw! You can't blind me. I'm a woman. Come, you are in love.' Herrick shrugged his broad shoulders. "'I do not see why I should deny it,' he said coldly. "'I'm in love with Miss Endicott, but so far as I can judge, she is not in love with me.' I don't think she's in love with anyone, replied Mrs. Marsh, but I have not seen enough of her to judge. If I could only see them together, I could tell. She likes Stephen, though. But here I am, chained to this bed, and cannot get out to attend to matters of importance. Hmm, she eyed Herrick steadily. So you are in love with her. Well, it has been the desire of my life to see Stephen married to Ida. But for all that, I want you to stay. Stephen shall give you a thousand a year to stay. My dear Mrs. Marsh, now don't contradict me, or you will put me out of temper, and you know what that means. I ask you to stop to show my regard for you. Many another woman would get you out of the way rather than see her pet scheme interfered with. I am not that sort of narrow-minded person. You shall have your chance along with Stephen. If she loves you, marry her in God's name, and let's have done with the matter. If, however, she prefers my poor Stephen, sweet-hearted fool that he is, you must promise me not to put any obstacle in the way of the marriage. If Miss Endicott prefers your stepson, I certainly should not think of objecting, Mrs. Marsh, said Herrick stiffly. Your remark is rather unnecessary. I don't think it is, retorted the widow. You are a gentleman. I know, but you are also a human being, and when love comes into the question, there are a few things a man will not do, 
or a woman for the matter of that. She clenched her thin hand that laid outside the coverlet, and her face darkened. I know, I know, she muttered between her teeth. Who should know but I who have suffered? Give me something to drink, doctor. My throat is dry with talking. I think I'd better leave you, said Herrick, after her thirst was assuaged. You are wearying yourself. Don't go, cried Mrs. Marsh abruptly. I have much to say of importance. I may not be here long to say it. Nonsense, Mrs. Marsh, you are getting better, much better. All the same I may die, one never knows, said the widow gloomily. Herrick laughed at these forebodings. What, said he, trying to joke her out of so morbid a mood? Have you enemies like Carr? Anyone who came into contact with Carr was bound to have enemies, said Mrs. Marsh bitterly. He was a devil, if ever there was one. However, this is not to the point. She went on impatiently. I want to know if you will stay with Stephen for a thousand a year. It is a tempting offer to a poor man like myself, said Herrick, with some hesitation. But until Stephen himself asks me to stay, I cannot promise. He may not wish. Oh, that is all right, Dr. Herrick. Stephen knows that you are his best friend. I want you to take him in hand and make a man out of him. He is too fond of poring over books and too careless of his physical health. Make him ride and golf and all the rest of it. I have been a fool keeping him so much beside me. But I love the boy, and that was my woman's weakness. Now he is rich. Teach him how to use his riches and be happy. You have the most influence over him, said Herrick, still hesitating. I have had too much, and not for the best, was her gloomy reply. No, you are the teacher he wants, besides. Who knows what may happen to me? Herrick looked at her uneasily. Again she had hinted at something of danger to herself. I wish you would be plain with me, he said. What do you mean? asked Mrs. Marsh with a frown. I think you can guess, retorted the doctor. You hint at your dying. So far as I know, there is not the least likelihood of your doing so unless you take an overdose of that chloral which I am always advising you to leave off. Have you some enemy who is likely to? No, replied Mrs. Marsh, with unnecessary violence. I have no enemy, but I feel. I have a presentiment that I am not long for this world. As an Italian, you know, I am bound to be superstitious. I should think that the English part of your blood would revolt against such morbid nonsense. Again, I say, you are not plain with me. I am. How dare you talk to me so, cried Mrs. Marsh furiously. You are the one man I have met in this world of fools, other than that dead devil Carr. If I made a confidant of any one, it would be of you. But so far as I personally am concerned, there is nothing to say. But Stephen, she hesitated, and fell to plucking restlessly at the coverlet. Well, you wish me to be his bear leader? If he's willing, I am willing. A thousand a year is not to be despised. Moreover, my conscience is perfectly clear as regards Miss Endicott. I understand. If she loves you, marry her by all means. If Stephen is her choice, you must promise. I promise nothing, said Herrick impatiently, walking to and fro. There's no necessity to promise. I'm a man of honor. If Stephen and Miss Endicott love one another, I am the last man in the world to step between them. You know that. If I didn't, I should not ask you to stop and look after him, said Mrs. Marsh cynically. However, you complained of my want of confidence. I am going to amend that. Do you know why I want you to stay with Stephen? To make a man of him, so you said. That certainly, but it is something of an excuse. I also want you, and this is the main reason, to guard him. Against whom? What are you hinting at? asked Herrick sharply. At Frisco, was the unexpected reply. Oh, you may look astonished, but if you remember the will, well. The will, repeated Dr. Jim, I see what you mean. The money goes to Frisco if Stephen should neglect to visit the vault monthly for a year. What of that? This much. Frisco killed Colonel Carr. Oh, I am sure of it. 
If not, why did he fly? Besides, there is no one else I can think of who had an interest in Carr's death. I do not know what secrets he had, but what there were, Frisco knew. That was why Carr left the money to him, failing Stephen. Nonsense! If Frisco possessed Colonel Carr's secrets, he could have blackmailed him without the necessity of murder. Ah, you don't know, cried Mrs. Marsh mysteriously. I have heard Frisco and Carr quarrel. It is my belief, if you remember Napper's evidence, that they quarreled on the night of the murder. They must have fought a duel, which is just what two devils like them would do. Frisco killed his master before he could fire a shot. That is why all the chambers of the revolver were found loaded. Well, Frisco has had to fly, but he will not give up his chance of getting the money. No, he will. Here Mrs. Marsh bent forward to whisper, he will try and maim or kill Stephen, so that he may not fulfill the conditions of the will, and visit the vault. Then Frisco will claim the money. I have thought this all out while lying here. It is ingenious, replied Herrick. But you forget that if Frisco shows himself, he will be arrested. That stops his attempting to harm Stephen. Mrs. Marsh shook her head. You do not know Frisco. I do, she said. And not another word could Herrick extract from her. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of the Silver Bullet by Fergus Hume》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Changeling While the tower at the Pines was being pulled down, Stephen paid frequent visits to Saxon. Sometimes Dr. Herrick went with him, and together they would go through the wonderful house. Marsh had never before been inside it, and he was amazed at the luxury. His life had been so simple, so deprived of all beauty, that his artistic temperament had been starved from lack of nutriment. Highly gifted with the imaginative faculty, possessed of a keen perception of loveliness, Stephen reveled in the beautiful things which filled every corner of the house. "'You will have to get a wife to share it all,' said Herrick one day, after his conversation with Mrs. Marsh. He looked keenly at the young man as he spoke. Stephen, however, betrayed no emotion. I suppose I shall have to marry some day, he said coolly. If I were to die without children, my cousin would get the property. I did not know you had a cousin, said Herrick, rather astonished. I believe so, a distant cousin, although I have never seen him. My mother can tell you all about him. It seems that Colonel Carr's father had a younger brother who was turned out by his father. He went to America and married there. Then he died, leaving a widow and a daughter. The widow died, and the daughter married someone in the States. I do not know the name, but my mother may. I believe there is a son, but whether he is in America or in England, I cannot say. Hmm, said Jim, very interesting. I must ask your mother about this. If you secure the property by complying with the conditions of the will, it will be yours entirely, even if you do not marry. You will be able to leave it to whomsoever you please. I should leave it to my cousin, whatever his name is, said Stephen, in a careless tone. It seems to me that he has the right to enjoy it after me, since he is of the car blood. Always provided you do not marry and have children. Of course, but there is time enough to think of marriage. I want my mother to be sole mistress of this beautiful place for a time. She has had such a dose of poverty that I should like her to taste luxury. You are not in love, then? asked Herrick in a jocular tone. I don't know. This time Stephen flushed. I'll tell you when I am. Meantime, let me enjoy the present. I'll soon have this tower down and the house put to rights. Then my mother can come. I hope you will stay also, Herrick, he added rather anxiously. I don't want to lose my friend, you know. It all depends, replied Jim with a flush. He was thinking of Ida. I will remain until your mother is quite well. You may be sure of that. 
Nothing more was said at the time. Herrick could not be certain that Stephen was in love with Ida or that the girl had set her heart on Marsh. They were excellent friends, but in spite of Herrick's lynx eye, he could not learn if they understood one another. As a matter of fact, they did, but neither of them wished to hurry matters. Both felt that Mrs. Marsh would have to be consulted before anything was settled, and therefore waited until she recovered her health and was established at the Pines. Mrs. Marsh slowly regained her strength and almost dispensed with Herrick's attendance. She never recurred to the subject of Ida or of Frisco after that one interview, although Herrick several times tried to make her speak. Evidently she knew something about the man, perhaps had heard the Colonel speak of him, but whatever it was she kept her own counsel. There was no need that she should do otherwise. Perhaps, if Frisco had made his appearance, she might have been induced to speak out, but the ex-sailor, as Herrick learned he was, had vanished completely. He was traced to Paddington Station, and after that all signs of the trail was lost. Like a raindrop, he had disappeared into the mighty sea of London life, and in spite of all offers of reward, not a hint could be gained of his whereabouts. It was generally considered that he was the criminal, most people holding that he had shot the colonel unawares. Knapper's evidence went to prove that the two men were on bad terms with one another, and probably Frisco, excited by rum and a sense of his wrongs, whatever these might be, had returned to the Pines with the intention of righting himself. No one entertained the idea of a duel having been fought. Only Mrs. Marsh gave Frisco that grace. Herrick considered her theory as a feasible one, and felt that it was confirmed by the fact of the revolver found in the dead man's hand being loaded. If Frisco had fired first, the colonel would have fallen with his weapon undischarged, and this would account for the six chambers being filled. But what it would not account for was the fact of one bullet being different to the remaining three. That was a puzzle, and Dr. Jim could in no wise arrive at the solution of the problem, although he thought over it a great deal. Bess Endicott was the only person who insisted on Frisco's innocence. She declared that the man was too devoted to his master to kill him, and that there could be no reason for the crime. This she explained to Herrick a week after the interview with Mrs. Marsh. Both Herrick and Marsh had come over to Biffstead to spend the afternoon, intending to return to Beerminster by the last bus somewhere about ten o'clock. It was characteristic of Stephen's simple habits that he still went to and fro by the public vehicle. Although he could now have afforded a cart, a horse, a bicycle, or even, had he so chosen, a motor car. But before taking full advantage of his new position and of his wealth, he wanted his mother to be well enough to direct matters. She had held him in subjection for so many years that he hesitated to do anything without her approval. So Herrick and Stephen came to Saxon by the bus or used their legs. For the sake of his health, Herrick made Marsh walk as much as possible. The man was visionary, and it was necessary to shake him into something like practical life by exercise. On arriving at the Grange, the two young men found the whole family at home. There was Ida, tall and beautiful, who welcomed the visitors in her usual placid way. She was of the Junoesque type, stately and maternal, moving like a large goddess amongst minor mortals. Bess, who was all alert and vivacious, was accustomed to make fun of Ida's stately ways. The sacred white cow, said Bess, folding her hands, and when Ida remonstrated, pointed out that the term meant no disrespect. Juno was called oxide, and I'm sure the cow is a most beautiful animal said she inconsequently, why should a comparison to a useful animal be taken as an insult? If I said you were like a fawn or a stag or a swan, you would be quite pleased. But because I call you a lovely snowy cow, you are a beautiful cow, broke off Bess with a shrug, the sacred white cow. There. Really, Bess, you are getting more dreadful every day, cried Ida helplessly. 
please don't call me this horrid name when Stephen and Dr. Herrick come. Dr. Herrick would understand. He is a scholar. However, I won't call you anything but Juno. Will that do? I should prefer to be called by my proper name. Bess made a mouth, but yielded the point. She was devotedly fond of Ida, and always said that her beauty would raise the family into affluence once more. My brains may do something, she said, but Ida's looks will attract all the men of wealth and position. I do not want any of them, protested Ida with a blush. Do let me see after my own future, Bess darling. Undeniably, Bess was the cleverest of the family. She was so bright and quick and possessed of such indomitable perseverance that she easily exercised a despotic sway over the weaker vessels. Ida looked after the house, but Bess was the real head who paid the bills and bullied the tradesmen and saw that everything was in order. Even Frank gave way before her, but Frank was rather like Ida in the matter of bovine simplicity. He was a big, handsome fellow, never out of temper. When he was not looking after the farm, he strolled in the fields and searched into the secret workings of nature. Sometimes he wrote articles for the papers and magazines. A Gilbert White of the parish of Saxon, that is what Frank Endicott was. Some of his articles had even been accepted in London, and when he could be induced to write, he usually made a few guineas. But Frank was lazy, and it needed all the scolding of Bess to make him do his duty in the way of literary work. So far as the farm went, he was never idle, as he loved an open-air life and took a genuine interest in stock, top drainage, and crops. Florence, who was now home on her weekly holiday, bounced out on Dr. Jim and Stephen as they came up the avenue. She was a girl in her teens, more like Bess than any of the rest, and bubbled over with animal spirits. This was her last quarter at school, and now her hair was turned up, she had arrived at the dignity of long frocks. But at heart she was still a schoolgirl, and on this especial day had let down her long hair much to the dismay of Ida, who was nothing if not conventional. "'Oh, Stephen!' she cried, clasping him by the arm. I am so glad you have come. Frank is writing, Bess is typing, and Ida is making a new dress. I have no one to amuse me. Where's the changeling? asked Stephen, laughing. Sidney? Oh, he has a holiday and has gone over to see the Pines. You know how fond he is of going there. He was the only one of us that was not afraid of the Colonel. I don't think Bess was. No, it would take an army to frighten Bess. How are you, Dr. Herrick? I am rude not to have spoken to you before. Come inside and wake us all up. I am sure this place is like the Palace of the Sleeping Beauty. Suppose we go over to the Pines and have an afternoon tea in one of the rooms, suggested Stephen. There is no food there, but we can take what we want from here and have a picnic. Jolly, cried Flo the schoolgirl. There are kettles and teapots and all the rest of the things we want at the Pines, I suppose. The house is remarkably well furnished, said Herrick, laughing. It is a good idea. Three o'clock. We'd better go at once. The others entered into the scheme with avidity, and thus it was that Herrick found himself walking beside Bess to the Pines. Not without a pang had he relinquished Ida to his friend but bearing in mind the confidence reposed in him by Mrs. Marsh, he desired to act as fairly as possible. Besides, he was growing fond of Bess. She was such a bright companion and so clever. At first she was disinclined to speak of the Colonel and Frisco, but gradually became more outspoken. In his quiet way, Herrick had a wonderful gift of making people talk. "'I wouldn't say it to anyone but you, Dr. Jim,' said Bess for so she now called him. But there is something about you that makes me believe in you. I think you must have some kind of demonic influence like Goethe. I am sympathetic, if that is what you mean, said Jim. I took to you immediately I saw you in the inn parlor. Bess blushed a little through her tanned skin, and cast a keen look at the big man. Somehow Herrick was conscious of that look, 
and wondered what it was for. Perhaps with a woman's quickness best divined that he admired Ida and did not approve of it. However, she was too clever to say anything, if such was the case. But went on to talk of Colonel Carr and Frisco. I liked Frisco, she said, in her quick, decisive way. He was a bad man, and some of the things he told me he had done were really dreadful. But somehow he was attractive, much better than the Colonel. I thought you liked the Colonel, said Jim, with a side glance. Well, you see, it was this way, replied the girl, laughing. I was rather bold in introducing myself to him, and he was so kind that I forgave him his bad reputation. How was it that you met him? I wanted some copy for the Chronicle and did not know what to write about. Something had to be done, so I kept my ears open for an idea. Ida happened to mention something about the Pines, so I thought it would be nice to see all the wonderful furniture that was in the house. Would you believe it, she added lightly. I went straight to the Pines and asked to see Colonel Carr. At first he refused, but I was so persistent that he let me come in. I told him frankly what I wanted and how hard up I was for an article. He was so taken back by my assurance that he said I could describe the pines provided I did so under a fictitious name. Then he took me all over the house himself, gave me tea in the big drawing room, and sent me off. I got a good article out of what he showed me, but of course I said that it was a description of a millionaire's palace in Park Lane. Nobody believed that. I think the Colonel guessed they wouldn't. He just let me write the article to make the people's mouth water with telling them about things he would not let them see. A nice Christian spirit, remarked Jim grimly. Ah, but you must remember that he was treated very badly by the country people when he came back from America. Oh, that America was the place of his exile? So Frisco said, Mexico and Peru. The two had many adventures and used to tell me about them. I made up several stories out of the material I got from them. You called to see the Colonel again, then? Why not? He was always polite, and I wasn't a bit afraid of him. Oh, I know he had a dreadful reputation, but he was never rude to me. Poor man, said Bess, letting her eyes rest pensively on the house which they were now approaching. I think he was very weary of living alone. Were the Colonel and Frisco good friends? The very best. Frisco adored the Colonel, who had saved his life. Both of them seemed rather afraid of... Here Bess was silent. Of what? I hardly know. But they hinted at some enemy who would kill the pair of them if he discovered their whereabouts. That was what Frisco meant at the public house when he hinted about his master not living long. If Frisco had given information, the enemy would have killed the colonel. I wonder if Frisco did, and then went away to escape the consequences. No, said Bess thoughtfully, Frisco would have been killed also. I think myself the enemy found out the colonel and murdered him. Then Frisco ran away to save his own life. Hmm. That's one way of looking at the matter. Did you hear if any stranger was seen in the neighborhood on the night of the murder? Bess looked quickly at her companion. No, she said, with some hesitation. I never heard of any one. Besides, it would have come out in the evidence. You have no idea who killed the man? Certainly not. If I knew, I should tell. There was something. I'll tell you that later. Tell it to me now. I can't do that until I get my facts together, said Bess firmly. Look here, Dr. Jim. I intend to find out the truth about this mystery. From something the Colonel let drop, I believe it is concerned with the money he came back with. From South America, or from North America, replied Miss Endicott musingly, I am not quite clear. But I'll ask you to help me when I get my facts together. You rouse my curiosity. Tell me now what you... I said no, and I mean no, retorted Bess, setting her mouth firmly. You will be here for some time yet. If you go away, I shall write to you. I am sure we shall find out who killed the Colonel, and I am equally sure that Frisco is not the man. 
Well, have it your own way. Tell me one thing. How is it the Colonel was so anxious about the preservation of his body? Ah, now you are asking more than I can tell you. You know, though, said Jim, looking at her sharply. I think I am not sure. Wait, Dr. Jim. In good time you shall know all that I know. This is a romance in real life. A tragedy, rather, said Herrick grimly. Mind you keep your promise. You can be sure I shall keep it, said Bess, nodding, and for the time being the matter ended. But Jim was considerably puzzled. How could she have got hold of information of which the police knew nothing was difficult to say. All the same, he had more confidence in the brains of Bess than in those of Inspector Bridge. As it was Saturday afternoon, the workmen had knocked off for the day. By this time the tower was half demolished, and curious it looked in its dilapidated state, with the pile of debris round about its base. The visitors looked at it for some time, then went into the house. In the kitchen off the dining room, they found an old woman who agreed to boil the kettle for them. After some deliberation, they fixed on the library as the best place for the meal. On entering, they found a boy reading in the corner under the window. "'You're here, Sidney,' said Ida, amazed. "'How can you come here without asking Stephen's permission?' "'Stephen doesn't mind, I'm sure,' replied Sidney with a smile, and Stephen assured him that he was welcome. While the others were talking and admiring the place, Dr. Jim stood looking at the boy, who was leaning back on the sofa, taken up with his own thoughts. There was something peculiar about Sidney Endicott, which procured in him the name of the changeling. This was given to him in fun by Bess, but many people in the village really believed that he was half a fairy, if not a whole one. This reputation rose from the fact that the lad possessed that gift which in Scotland is called the second sight. No one in Saxon, who saw Master Sidney's large blue eyes fixed upon him or her, but turned pale. In Italy he would have been credited with the evil eye, and indeed old Petronella always crossed herself when she chanced to meet him. Once or twice Sidney had foretold the death of those who had afterwards died. Thus he had an uncanny reputation. He was a small, thin boy, looking much older than his years. Although he was but sixteen, yet on occasion he looked quite twenty. Pale, thin-faced, with large blue eyes and a curious, insistent gaze, he sometimes made even his own family feel uncomfortable. Then he had such peculiar habits. At night he was generally wakeful, and slept much of the daytime, particularly in cold weather. Sometimes he would slip out of his bedroom by the window and remain away for hours. When questioned where he had been, he used vaguely to answer, in the wood. The doctor who had seen him could make nothing of him. He was healthy in his own way, his head was clear, and Corn reported that he learned rapidly. But about him hung a glamour, not of this world. He might have been a male Kilmeny who had returned from fairyland. Bess sometimes called him Thomas the Rhymer. When she did so, Sidney would nod and laugh in so strange a way that Bess herself grew frightened and dropped the name. "'How do you feel today, Sidney?' asked Jim, sitting down beside the boy. "'Not very well,' he replied vaguely. "'I feel that I am not myself. I came here to read myself to sleep.' "'Why did you want to do that?' because I could go away then. I always do when I feel like this. Like what? Jim was puzzled. The boy was by no means mad, yet he talked in a manner quite beyond the comprehension of a sane person. Jim had never met anyone like him before, and was much taken up with the oddity of the case from a medical point of view. I can't explain. You would not understand, said Sidney. Please leave me alone, Dr. Herrick. At this moment Bess called to Jim from the other side of the room, and he hurried across to her. Sidney remained vaguely staring into nothingness. After a time his eyes closed, and he looked as though he were fast asleep. 
The others gathered round the tea table and prepared to eat. Bess would not allow her brother to be awakened. It makes him ill if he is roused suddenly, she said. He will wake up himself and be all right. It doesn't look to me like a natural sleep, said Jim anxiously. How pale he is, don't you think? No, said Ida sharply. I agree with Bess. Sidney had better be left alone. He gets into these states at times. Let us have tea. I am so hungry, and it's past five. A quarter past, said Stephen, glancing at his watch. They began to eat and drink, laughing and enjoying themselves. No one took any notice of Sidney, and even Jim's attention was distracted. The boy remained on the sofa, leaning back, white as snow, and drawing long, deep breaths. He looked like a dead person. After a time, the conversation languished. The tea was done, the food was finished, and they talked about packing up to go. Poor Sidney's tea is quite cold, said Ida. I really think we might wake him now. Oh, he's coming to himself. Wake up, Sidney, and have some tea. It is nearly six, and we must be getting home. The boy's face now had a delicate pink tinge on it, and he seemed more himself than he had been when he fell asleep. For a moment he was silent. Then he looked slowly round at those who were present, until his blue eyes fixed themselves calmly on Stephen. "'Mr. Marsh,' he said quietly, "'you had better go home. Your mother is dead.' Ida gave a cry, and Stephen turned pale. Bess alone retained sufficient presence of mind to cross over to the boy and shake him. Sidney. What do you mean by saying such a horrible thing? It is true, replied the boy quietly. Mrs. Marsh is dead. I have just seen her. She died at half past five. Go home, Stephen. Without a word, Marsh rushed from the room. He knew of Sidney's prophecies and dreaded lest this one should be true. He made for Beerminster as fast as he could go and was met by Petronella. My Padrona is dead said the old woman. End of chapter 6「七日目の夜、ペトロネラは、ペトロネラは、ペトロネラは、ペトロネラは、ペトロネラは、ペトロネラは、ペトロネラは、ペトロネラは、ペトロネラは、ペトロネラは、ペトロネラは、ペトロ
She told me to give her the chloral as she wanted to sleep. I asked her if she had bad news in the letter. She said no, but that she felt suddenly sick. I gave her the medicine in the little bottle and went away. She took some, I think, for when I went up again, an hour later, she was asleep. I went again and again, and she was still asleep. Then I took up her tea and wanted to wake her. Grand Dio, she was dead, dead. What time was that, Petronella? At half past five, Signor, the hour when I always take up the Signora's tea. Oh, she is dead, and I nursed her. Cursed be it that I live still. While the old woman wailed, Stephen shuddered. The hour was that which Sidney had named. Are you sure she died at that time? he asked. Quite sure, Signor Stefano. When I went in before, she was only asleep. I saw her breathing. I was up at a quarter past five, and she still breathed, and had a color in her poor cheek. When I set down the tray, I turned to see that she was quite still her face pale as snow. I put my hand to her heart. She was dead. Ah, Dio mio! She must have passed away when I entered the room. I heard a sigh at the door, said Petronella, beginning to embellish. It was her spirit that passed. What could I do but open the window and let the soul go free? Ah, holy virgin! And the old woman crossed herself again. By this time, Stephen had somewhat recovered his composure. Without a word, he went up to the room. Petronella had drawn a sheet over the dead. He drew it down gently and saw the waxen face beneath. Every wrinkle had been smoothed away, and there rested a peaceful expression on that once stormy countenance. As Marsh stood tearlessly looking at the dead, he heard a light step enter the room. Herrick appeared, almost as pale as the dead woman. After a glance at the corpse, he recognized that all was over, and looked at Marsh with a shudder. Yes, whispered the young man, replying to the unspoken thought, at half-past five o'clock. Herrick shuddered again, and drew a sheet over the dead face. Then he took Stephen by the arm and led him downstairs into the study. There he left him in a chair and went into the dining-room, whence he returned with a decanter and two glasses. Pouring out two stiff glasses of brandy, he forced Stephen to drink one, and took the other himself. Both were in need of the stimulant, for the event had shaken them considerably. By and by, Marsh laid down his head on the table and wept quietly. He had been devoted to the dead woman, and was all unstrung. Moreover, the uncanny way in which the first announcement of the death had been made shocked him deeply. Herrick went out to see Petronella. He found her in the death chamber. A genuine Romanist, she had placed candles round the bed and a crucifix on the breast of the dead. On her knees she was praying aloud. Seeing that all had been done that could be done, Herrick returned to the study. Stephen was calmer and inclined to talk. It was half past five, as Sidney said, he said in a low voice. Oh, Herrick, what does it mean? I don't know, said the usually skeptically doctor. After you had gone, I asked the boy how he knew. He said that while he was asleep, he had dreamed. So he put it, that he was standing in your mother's bedroom. She was dying in a stupor, and he saw the breath gradually leave her body. He also said that he saw her spirit after she was dead. But, of course, that must be nonsense. After what he said, I can believe anything, said Marsh. What else? Well, said Jim, uncomfortably, he described the bedroom exactly. Was he ever in it, Stephen? No, certainly not. And he described it? Exactly, and as being in the state in which it is now. He said that Petronella came in at the door with a tray and placed it beside the bed. She then put her hand on your mother's heart and found she was dead. Afterwards, she opened the window. Why, what, Stephen? My God, cried the young man, now ghastly white. That is exactly what Petronella told me she did. Oh, oh, and he fainted. Herrick scarcely wondered at it. 
He felt deadly sick himself, and it needed another glass of brandy before he could recover himself sufficiently to attend to the unconscious man. Next day the news was known all over Beelminster, and Sidney's prophecy also. The Endicott family would fain have kept it to themselves, but Sidney himself had spread the news. For on the way home, and before the rumor could have reached Saxham, which it did not until late that night, he told several people of Mrs. Marsh's death and the hour at which it had occurred. So the report spread, and that night Saxham, accustomed to Sidney's second sight, was in a ferment. Many believed, others doubted, and the upshot was that a few inquirers went over the Beale Mister, whence they rushed back with a confirmation of the news. Mrs. Marsh was dead, and moreover, she had passed away at half-past five. Until a late hour that night, nothing was talked about but this wonderful boy, and next morning a crowd collected about the Grange, hoping to catch a glimpse of him. Ida was very angry at Sidney's indiscretion and told him so. He took it all placidly. Why should I not say that Mrs. Marsh was dead, he asked. She is dead, and she died at the time I said. But how did you know, Sidney, dear? asked the perplexed sister. When I was on the sofa in the library, I dreamed I was in her room. I saw her die, and the white spirit get out of her body. The spirit pointed to a bottle on the table beside the bed, and then I forgot all till I woke on the sofa and saw Stephen looking at me. Then I told him to go home. There's nothing strange about it, Ida. You know I can see things. Ida shuddered and ran away to tell Bess that Sidney was a most uncomfortable person to talk to. The boy stayed indoors at the request of Bess all the morning, and then slipped off into the afternoon to go to his favorite haunt in the pine wood. When he came into the village the next day, he refused to talk of his dream or vision or whatever it might be called, and seemed quite cross when it was referred to. From that day Sidney was shunned as though he had the plague. Everyone was afraid of being told too much about themselves or their relations. This troubled the boy very little. He went on living in his usual dreamy way and had no more visions for a time. Even at Biffstead he was regarded as something dangerous. But there, by tacit consent, the subject was dropped. What Dr. Jim thought of all this, it was difficult to say. Sidney's prophecy was thrown into the background so far as he was concerned by the discovery that Mrs. Marsh had died from an overdose of chloral. He had always warned her that she might make a mistake, and apparently she had done so at last. But when Petronella told him of the letter, he changed his mind. What if she had committed suicide? He recollected her vague allusions to enemies, and her persistent declaration that she might not live long. At once he set about hunting for the letter, Petronella helping him. But it was not to be discovered, although they searched high and low. At last Herrick spied ashes in the fireless grate, and found that some paper had been burnt. Without doubt the letter Mrs. Marsh had received. Was there a fire in the grate on the day Mrs. Marsh died, he asked? No, Signor Doctore, the grate was empty. Of course, I need not have asked. This flimsy stuff would have been swept away with the ashes. Hmm. She must have got up and burnt the letter, and then... Well, we must wait for the inquest. It was Herrick who attended to all the details of the funeral, as Marsh was completely bewildered by the sudden catastrophe. The inquest resulted in a verdict that Mrs. Marsh had died from an overdose of chloral, but no one hinted at suicide. As Dr. Jim gave evidence of her use of the drug to alleviate pain and obtain sleep, it was concluded that she had miscalculated the dose. Even Stephen believed that this was the case, for Herrick said nothing of his suspicions. What Petronella thought, Dr. Jim could not find out. She was as secret as the grave. Mrs. Marsh was buried in the family vault 
of the cars at Saxham. A large number of people came to the funeral, not because the dead woman had been popular, but because they wished to attend the rites of a person whose death had been foretold in so curious a manner. In the vault, the coffin was laid beside that of the late colonel, and Herrick shuddered as he thought of these enemies lying side by side. Certainly, when the new vault was ready, the body of the colonel would be removed to it, in accordance with the terms of the will. But it would be some time before this was completed, and meantime Carr's body remained in the old sepulcher. Pending its removal, Stephen had had a new iron door put on the old vault, and kept the key to himself. It was quite safe in his pocket, and he never parted from it. After the funeral, Herrick made several attempts to discover something about the letter delivered to Mrs. Marsh on the day of her death, although he was careful not to hint that it had any connection with her sudden end. But although he questioned the postman and the postal authorities, he could gain very little satisfaction. It was a plain envelope stamped, so far as could be remembered, with the London postmark. Hum, said Dr. Jim to himself when he acquired this information. Frisco is in London. I wonder if he wrote that letter. However, it was little use conjecturing. Mrs. Marsh was dead, and had taken her secret and the secret of Colonel Carr along with her into the next world. Herrick put the idea out of his head, as he had much to do in considering his future position. Three or four days after the funeral, he was alone with Stephen in the Bureau Minster house and there spoke to the young man about his movements. "'I must return to London, Marsh,' he said. "'I can do no more good here, and I must attend to my practice.' "'No,' replied Stephen quickly. "'You must not leave me like this, Herrick. "'I have grown used to you as a companion. "'I like you more than any man I ever met, "'and without you I should be lost. "'You must stay with me. "'Is your practice a large one?' On the contrary, it is very small. I have been established in West Kensington only for two years. If I had not a small income of my own, I should starve. Well, you must come to me. I hope you will, Herrick. I am rich, and I can allow you a good income, say a thousand a year. That is generous of you, Marsh. Did your mother speak of this to you? No, she did not. Why do you ask? Because she wanted me to stay with you and proposed the same amount. "'I am glad,' cried Stephen, his face lighting up. "'I can do this much at least for her memory. So she wished you to remain with me? You will, of course. I cannot do without you.' Herrick smoked in silence for a few minutes. "'A man in my position has no right to turn his back on such good fortune. All the same, Marsh, if I did not like you personally, if I did not think I could earn my income by helping you, I would not take the position. Then you will do so, cried Stephen, stretching out his hand. The doctor grasped it heartily in token of acceptance. But I am not without scruples as to taking such a large amount of money, said he. I make only a couple of hundred a year by my practice. You rate me at a high value. Not too high for the good you will do me, said Marsh heartily. I have been a different man since you came into my life. You have shown me how to look at things in a broader spirit. I am less morbid than I was. No, Herrick, I have eight thousand a year, and you shall have the sum I name. Very good. I am delighted. But for what period? You see, Marsh, some day you will marry, and then you will find in your wife the companion necessary to your existence, and you will not want me. I think we had better make an agreement for three years. By that time, I shall have done you all the good I can, and you will be used to your position. And, continuing Jim, looking into the young man's eyes, you will be looking for a wife. Stephen nodded. Three years, then, he said. If you want a document, the lawyers can draw it up. As to marrying, I dare say I shall marry. Already I have. Here he broke off abruptly. There are some things a man cannot talk about, even to his best friend. Let the subject of love and marriage be tabooed between us, Herrick. 
certainly replied the doctor rather stiffly i have no wish to force your confidence marsh it's not that but i have an idea in my head it may come to nothing on the other hand well he dismissed it with a wave of his hand time enough to talk about it when it ripens let us change the subject in the face of this unwillingness on the part of marsh herrick was obliged to do as he was asked he wondered if stephen really loved ida endicott or whether it was bess who attracted him time alone would reveal the truth so herrick for the moment thought no more about the matter he had engaged himself to look after stephen and at once set to work to earn his income the subject was introduced by marsh i think you and i ought to go abroad for a year or two he said restlessly i feel that both beelminster and saxham are distasteful to me for a time i have arranged to let petronella live here on a small income i thought she would like to return to italy but she begged me to allow her to stay here for a time i asked her to go to the pines but she refused so here she must stay and you and i herrick we will go up to london for a couple of weeks said herrick promptly but i want to go further afield and for a longer time have you forgotten the terms of the will put in dr jim you must pay a monthly visit to that vault or your money goes to frisco stephen nodded somewhat grimly i should have remembered said he yes i cannot travel until the year is at an end but even if it so happens that i did not go to the vault and lost the money i do not think that frisco would return to claim it well i don't know replied herrick musingly after all we cannot be certain that frisco killed his master he may reappear and explain his flight and prove his innocence on the face of it it would seem he is guilty but the evidence is all circumstantial better stick to the terms of the will and not give him a chance of claiming the money very good herrick then we will go up to london and you can take me to taylor's and all the other tradesmen whose goods I may need. I want you to educate me, Dr. Jim. You have had a varied experience of the world, and I have not. I am a country mouse, and you are the town one. At thirty-five, I must have had some experience, Marsh. Yes, I have traveled in my time. I have been round Europe with a man I was trying to reclaim from strong drink. Did you succeed? partly replied the doctor with a shrug he is a fairly decent member of society now nothing to boast of well marsh i've also been a doctor on a liner to the east finally i went with an expedition into the interior of africa now i am settled in the dull quarter of west kensington and often wish i could be off again on the long trail civilized life is too respectable for me when the year is out, we will go on that long trail together. Well, said Herrick, an exploration of our planet will do you no harm. Later on you can settle down and be comfortable with a wife. I beg your pardon. I am trenching on forbidden ground. However, Marsh, I am glad things are so arranged. It is a bit of good luck for me. And for me also, Herrick, you can do me nothing but good. I hope so, said Herrick cheerfully. The first thing I intend to do is take you out into the open air. You must hunt and shoot and golf and swim. Get yourself into a state of physical perfection. Your mind is all right. I like your poems, and you have it in you, to do great things, Marsh. But first of all, you must attend to the body. I have neglected these things, said Stephen, straightening himself. But my life was so narrow that I did not look after myself as a man should. Besides, to tell you the truth, Herrick, I am so much of the student that out-of-door life never attracted me. That is because you have never had a companion to interest you in the life, said Herrick, smiling. Now, I am devoted to athletic sports of all kind. If I can infect you with my enthusiasm, you will soon be able to take the deepest interest in them yourself. Not that I was fortunate enough to succeed with Joyce, finished Dr. Jim with a shrug. 
Ah, your friend, who is staying at the Carr Arms. I never met him. You will when we go to town. He is not a bad little chap, but his brain is too large for his body, besides which he is neurotic and intensely trying at times. I don't suppose I should have cured him altogether, but I could have made him twice the man he was, had he only taken my advice. But Robin was always as obstinate as a mule. He lives into himself and for himself. There is no hope for a man like that. I hope you will succeed with me, Herrick. I am certain to succeed with you. In the first place, your nerves are not diseased. In the second, you are less selfish. And thirdly, you are sensible enough to see sense. And that last is not given to many men. Well, we have had a long talk, Marsh, so we had better go to bed and begin our new life tomorrow. It was three days after this that the two went up to London. Herrick called at Biffstead and told Bess about his new relations with Stephen. She expressed herself greatly pleased. You will do him no end of good, she said. Physical exercise is what he needs. He is making good use of his money, she added emphatically. You have too good an opinion of me, Miss Bess. The girl laughed and blushed in her heart. She liked Herrick greatly. He was so big, so strong, so sensible exactly the sort of man she admired. Frank, her brother, resembled him in many ways, but he was not so worldly wise, nor perhaps so clever. However, she was too much the woman to make a direct reply to Herrick's speech and change the subject. When you come back, we must have our talk, she said. Meantime, I shall give you something to go on with in London. Do you know anything about cryptographs, Dr. Jim? No, I've looked into the subject once or twice, but I never did much good at it. Why? Bess went to her desk and fished out a bit of paper. I want you to see if you can solve this, she said. I have done my best and failed. It is a piece of paper I picked up in the Colonel's house when he was alive. I am sure it has to do with his secret, whatever that might be. Else why should it be in secret writing? Herrick took the paper she held out. It was a yellow kind of Chinese paper, tough and wrinkled. On it was written in red ink the following. Uppercase S, period, G, period, D, period. Space, uppercase K, period, uppercase Z, period, uppercase R, period, uppercase S, period. Space, uppercase V, period, Z period, Q period, M period, H period, F period, space, uppercase S period, H period, K period, K period, space, one period, five period, L period, T period, K period, X period, space, uppercase S period, I period, D period, N period, space, uppercase C period, D period, Z period, S period, G period, space, uppercase T period, M period, K period, D period, R period, R period. This jumble of letters made Herrick stare. He could make nothing of them, yet here, no doubt, was the secret of Colonel Carr. Perhaps if the writing could be read, the reason of his death might be explained. Even the name of the assassin might be given. Bess watched him eagerly. "'What do you think of it?' she asked. "'I dare say it may help us,' Herrick said doubtfully. "'If the Colonel had a secret.' "'If he had,' cried Bess emphatically, "'I know he had.' then it may be contained in this mixture of letters. You have failed, you say? Well, Miss Bess, I don't know that I shall succeed. However, I will try. You will let me have this? If you will take the very greatest care of it, I have a copy to be sure, but that is the original. I'll bring it back to you safe and sound in two weeks. You will be back then, she asked with a quick flush. Certainly, 
I shall arrange about my practice and return for good. Bess looked down. I'm glad, she said in a low tone. Then, thinking she might have said too much, she smiled in his face. Of course I'm glad, she cried gaily. Are we not pledged to find out who killed the colonel? End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight of the Silver Bullet by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Curious Discovery. It was now quite two months since the death of Colonel Carr, and all this time Robin had been in London. He had written to Herrick, telling him that he felt so much better that he would not go abroad. I have a new idea for a novel, wrote Joyce, and now that I have the leisure, I intend to throw myself heart and soul into it. I still keep on my flat. Herrick therefore determined that his first visit should be to the little man. Stephen and the doctor took up their abode in the Gulliff Hotel in Germain Street. It was the first time the young man had been in London, and the novelty and excitement of town life did much to dispel the grief he felt for the death of his stepmother. It was not that he regretted her the less, but he was sensible enough to see that it was foolish to weep over an irremediable misfortune. He therefore took Herrick's advice and threw himself with ardor into fitting himself out with a complete wardrobe for the first time in his life. The doctor took him to the best West End shops, instructed him in the topography of the fashionable locality, and when Stephen was fairly set going, found time to attend to his own business. He first went to his house in West Kensington, and saw that it was all right. Then he called upon the young practitioner, who had nursed his practice while he was away, and made him an offer to sell it. The young doctor, who had only lately started in the district, was overjoyed at the chance, as Jim had got together a fair number of patients. Herrick made the terms of purchase as light as possible and spread the payments over a considerable time. Dr. Grant asked two days for consideration. As being poor, it was necessary he should see his way how to pay the money. At once Jim consented to this, and after finishing this necessary business, he went off to Robin's flat. The arrangement and discussion with Grant had taken up the best part of the afternoon, and it was close upon seven when Herrick found time to see his friend. At first he hesitated, and half made up his mind to put it off until the next day. But as he was in the neighborhood, he finally decided to go, and sent a wire to Marsh that he would not be home until ten o'clock. He intended to ask Joyce for a meal, making sure that he would be welcome. Yet, strange to say, Robin was not so hearty as Herrick expected. Perhaps he had not got over his anger at the desertion of the doctor. But after his last letter, Jim could not think that such was the case. In spite of their severance, Herrick still wished to keep an eye on Robin, knowing that he was foolish in many ways. Therefore, when Joyce showed a disposition not to invite him to stay, Herrick at once determined that he would remain. There was a reason at the back of this confusion, and Herrick, in the interest of a weak man, resolved to find out what it might be. Seeing that he was bent on remaining, Robin made the best of what he evidently considered a bad job, and became more of his old self. "'You are not looking so well as your letter let me to hope, Robin,' said Herrick, when the two were smoking in the study. "'I am in the best of health,' said Robin quickly, "'but of course I have been working hard at my book, and that takes it out of a chap.' "'Read me some of the chapters,' said Herrick, who once had been a kind of literary adviser to the author. Robin shook his head uneasily. Not until the book is done, he said. I want you to get an impression as a whole. This will be my masterpiece. Besides, he added, glancing at the clock, we might be interrupted. At half past seven a friend of mine is coming to dinner. I hope my unexpected coming will not upset your arrangements, Joyce. Oh, of course not. How can you think so? said Robin, with an air of constraint 
that did not escape Herrick. You are always welcome. Will you stop the night? I can put you up. No, I must get back to Marsh. I am his companion and doctor for the time being. A very good billet, I assure you, Robin. What about your practice? asked Joyce. I am now selling it to Grant. It is such a small practice that it is not worth my while to stick to it as against an assured income of a thousand a year. Is that what Marsh gives you? Yes, I do not mind telling you, Robin, as you are such an old friend. But do not mention this to anyone else. I stay with Marsh for three years. In this way, I shall be able to save money and buy a practice in the better part of town. It is a wonderful bit of luck. It is indeed, and I congratulate you, said Robin cheerfully, and shaking his friend by the hand. Marsh must be well off to be able to afford your companionship at that price. Yes, he has been left about eight thousand a year, more or less, by Colonel Carr, his late uncle. But that is his business, Robin. We will not talk about it. Have they yet found out who killed Colonel Carr? Not yet. Of course it is supposed that Frisco killed him. But the man has disappeared. When he is caught, we shall know the truth. You read the case, Robin. What do you think? It seems as though that man were guilty, replied Joyce slowly. But I am not prepared to offer an opinion. The fact is, I am so busy with my book that I have put all these horrors out of my head. By the way, what about your Southberry Helen? Miss Endicott? Oh, I've seen a good deal of her. Are you still in love? Not very passionately, perhaps, but I think a respectable affection is better to marry upon than a wild romantic adoration that will not resist the wear and tear of life. I hope some day, if Miss Endicott will allow me, to marry her. That is when I have a good practice. But if another man more worthy of her comes along, why? Ardent lover, laughed Joyce. If you really felt any passion, you would not contemplate with equanimity the idea of an intruder. I believe you like that little journalistic girl better. A kind of dull anger stirred in the doctor's breast at hearing Bess so flippantly alluded to. But he saw that Joyce did not mean any harm, so he turned off the remark with a laugh. She is a charming young lady, Robin, but she is better as a comrade than she would be as a wife. A comrade is what you want, said Joyce shrewdly. Your lukewarm affection will not win you the love of a woman. Perhaps not, however, we shall see. Herrick was annoyed, for he felt there was some truth in this remark. He was glad when a ring came to the door and interrupted a conversation which was rapidly getting unpleasant to him. There's your friend. Who is he? A Mexican called Don Manuel Santiago. Hmm. It's not often one foregathers with that nationality in London. Where did you meet him? At the Apollo Club. Johnston introduced me to him. Here he is. I think you will like him. Herrick was not so sure. He had met with Mexicans on their native heath and did not like the breed. However, as the man was the guest of Joyce, he felt compelled to behave at least politely. All the same, knowing Robin's weakness in picking up doubtful acquaintances, he determined to be observant of the Mexican. Dr. Herrick, Don Manuel Santiago, and this senor is my very best friend. The little dark man clicked his heels together, foreign fashion, and bowed politely. Herrick looked at him from head to foot in one swift glance and made up his mind that the man was a rogue an adventurer, if nothing worse. He was not tall, and he was very lean. His face was swarthy. He had a hooked nose, a black mustache, and a pair of restless, shifty, dark eyes. Accurately dressed in an evening suit, he wore too much jewelry. Yet, for all this, he did not look vulgar. There was a somewhat dangerous air about him. Herrick, watching his face intently, made up his mind that Don Manuel was a half-caste Indian. "'I am pleased to meet you, senor,' said Don Manuel, in good English but with a foreign accent. "'Dr. Herrick. Ah, I know the name.' 
Indeed, said Dr. Jim, looking surprised. Robin also shared his astonishment and expressed it. Why, Santiago, you did not tell me you knew Herrick, said he, as they took their seats at table. Did I not? replied the Don carelessly. Ah, that was no doubt because his name was never mentioned between us. But if I am not mistaken, he said, addressing himself directly to Jim, you are concerned in that strange case of my friend, Colonel Carr. Herrick almost bounded from his seat. That here of all places, and in so unexpected a way, he should meet with a stranger who knew Carr, was like fiction. Had the incident occurred in a novel, he would have put it down as a freak of imagination on the author's part. Yet the thing had happened in real life, and to himself. Was Carr a friend of yours? he asked. Twelve years and more ago, replied Santiago quietly, we knew one another intimately in Mexico. Mexico, muttered Herrick, recalling what Bess had said about Frisco's tale of North and South America. Not in Peru. We went to Peru together on an expedition. What sort of expedition? asked Joyce eagerly. To make our fortunes. That is the sort of expedition we all are bound to undertake. Herrick thought of Colonel Carr's money. Was he on the point of learning sufficient of the man's wild life in the Americas to reveal what his secret was? Did you succeed? he asked. I did not. The Colonel did. Afterwards he returned to England, and I lost sight of him. When I came over six months ago, I heard of him and intended to pay him a visit. But I put it off and off and off until... He made a rapid gesture. Poor Carr. His was a sad end. An unexpected one, said Herrick, fixing his eyes on the man. Did you know his servant, Frisco? No, replied Manuel calmly. Frisco was after my time, or before it. I forget which. Somehow Herrick felt instinctively that this was a lie. According to Best, the ex-sailor had been with Carr throughout his wandering life. It was incredible that if such was the case, and Jim preferred to believe Frisco rather than Santiago, that Frisco should not have gone to Peru. He would be needed on an expedition such as Manuel spoke of. Were you treasure hunting? asked Jim. Don Manuel nodded. Yes. The Peruvians buried a lot of gold and jewels at the time of the conquest. Carr got wind of a hiding place from someone, an Indian, I believe, and induced me to go with him to Peru. I was doing nothing at the time, so I went. Carr found the treasure? I believe so. Colonel Carr was rich, was he not? Very rich, chimed in Joyce. Do you remember, Herrick, how astonished we were at the magnificence of that house? I remember, said Herrick curtly. The interruption did not please him, as he wanted particularly to hear what Santiago had to say. But, Señor Manuel, if you started on this search together, how was it that you do not know for certain if Colonel Carr was successful? Don Manuel's face grew black and his eyes flashed. If you would know the reason, Señor, Colonel Carr was a devil. Ah, said Herrick with a short laugh, that is no news. We shared the expenses of the expedition. We were to share the profits. But Carr treated me shamefully. The treasure was said to be concealed beyond Cruzo, where it does not matter. I know, but I do not intend to tell. I fell ill at the first stage of the journey, after we left Cuzco, and we were amongst the mountains. What did Carr do? He left me to the care of the Indians and pushed on himself. That was the last I saw of the devil. For two years I was held captive amongst the Indians and barely escaped with my life. I hunted for Carr when I got to Cayo. But he had disappeared. I traced him to Mexico. He had vanished from Veracruz. I was worn out and ill. I went back to my own family. And all these years I have thought nothing about the Colonel. But chance brought me to England, and chance led me to here where Colonel Carr was settled. As I said, I would have seen him to reproach him for his treachery, but 
Don Manuel shrugged. He is dead. That is the end. A strange story, and not credible to Carr, said Herrick, wondering if all this was a lie. Who was it told you where Colonel Carr lived? I did not, said Joyce, on whose face Jim's eyes rested for a moment. I knew nothing of this until this moment. Where I heard the name, senor, can be of little interest to you, said the Don, with a sneer. It was in London. I tell you no more. I do not want you to tell me anything, retorted Herrick, the blood rushing to his face. So far, I am interested in your story. But if you choose to be silent, you are at liberty to do so. Pardon, said Manuel humbly. I did not intend to provoke your anger. But as he spoke, there was a nasty glitter in his eyes. I cannot tell you who gave me the information without breaking confidence with a friend. Herrick grunted, but he said nothing. Santiago was evidently a dangerous little devil. For all he knew, the Mexican might have had something to do with the murder. Of all the strange circumstances that Herrick had stumbled upon, this surely was the strangest. To find the man who knew of the past of Colonel Carr in the company of Robin Joyce. As the meal was now at an end, the three adjourned to the study where they began to smoke. Herrick had his pipe, Joyce a cigarette, and Manuel produced one of those long, lean Mexican cigars that only a hardened smoker can enjoy. As he bent forward over the spirit lamp, Jim saw by the touch of gray on his temples and the wrinkles down the side of his neck that the man was much older than he had thought. At the first glance, Santiago looked, if you want it to be disagreeable, say thirty-five. Herrick was now sure that he was over fifty, but the man was in wonderfully good condition. Having noticed him at the table, Jim saw that he was both abstemious and temperate. For some reason not apparent, Manuel desired to ingratiate himself with Herrick, and tried by picturesque talk to banish the disagreeable impression he had made by his last remark. He told the most wonderful stories of his adventures by land and sea. According to his own account, he had lived a life of hairbreadth escapes. South America he knew from Quito to the Horn, and had explored the unknown portions at the risk of his life. He had been captive to Indians. He had been tortured, Herrick noted, that his left ear was missing. And he had been almost frozen while ascending Chimborazo. Then he had hunted for treasure, fought for it with knives when it was found, and by his own confession had more than one death to his account. All this he told in vivid picturesque language and with a wonderful command of the English tongue. Herrick complimented him on his capabilities as a linguist. Oh, I know seven or eight languages, said Manuel boastfully, not to speak of Indian dialects. I have been all over Europe. Yes, senor, when I made money, and I have made a great deal, I came always to Europe to spend it. That I did royally. Oh, they know me in every capital. Of all, give me Vienna. Oh, senor, I am known on the Prater and to the police, no doubt, thought Herrick, but for his own private reasons did not give vent to this opinion. He said aloud, I suppose, Don Manuel, you were not surprised to hear of Colonel Carr's death. Santiago flashed a quick glance at the imperturbable countenance of the doctor. Oh, but I was, said he, to escape all the dangers of the tropics, and then to die in a quiet little English village, strange. To be sure, though, added Manuel, with another glance, he brought his murderer with him, and Frisco was capable of anything. Oh, put in Herrick sharply, I thought you did not know Frisco. Nor did I, senor, said Santiago, covering his mistake with wonderful swiftness. But I heard of him. He was a devil worse than Carr, if that can be possible. They were attached to one another, but quarreled. Oh, yes, senor. I assure you they quarreled. Once over a game of cards, Carr slashed Frisco across the face. Oh, that was it, was it? murmured Herrick, as he recalled the criss-cross slash on Frisco's face 
which had been described to him. A queer couple. What was Frisco's real name? I do not know, snapped Manuel, with a surprising curtness, considering his light, voluble talk. Shortly he took his leave, with a politely expressed hope that he would meet Herrick again. When the Mexican was gone, Joyce turned eagerly to his friend and asked what he thought of him. If you want to know my real opinion, he is a thorough little blackguard. Cut him, Robin, or you will get in trouble. I don't see why I should. He's a decent fellow. His only vice is gambling. He would sell his shirt to gamble. Hmm. Looks a card sharper. Where does he gamble, principally? In a club down in Pimlico, the Parrot Club. Very few people know about it, but the play is very high. Oh, so you met Santiago there, said Herrick lazily. But Joyce saw the trap and avoided it. No, I told you I met him at the Apollo Club. That is respectable enough, I hope, and Archie Johnson introduced him to me. He is decent, isn't he? Oh, I have nothing to say, replied Herrick with a yawn, putting on his coat, only that if that man gets you into trouble, don't blame me. He will probably induce you to gamble, and all your new income of five hundred a year will go once and for all. A peculiar expression swept across Joyce's face as he opened and shut his hands nervously. However, he held his tongue, and having said good night, Herrick went away, sorry to see that his friend was in such bad company. He regarded Don Manuel as a rook and Joyce as a pigeon, but he knew the little man well enough to know that his interference was vain. Joyce could be as obstinate as a mule at times. When he got back to the Gullop Hotel, it was close on eleven. All the same, Stephen was sitting up for him over a meditative pipe. The sight of his honest, handsome face was quite a relief to Herrick after the crafty looks of Manuel. And, truth to tell, Joyce had also fallen in Herrick's estimation, for as a man he could not compare with Marsh. Not for the first time, Dr. Jim began to think, that there was something sly and evil about Robin. Hitherto he had been too much taken up with the man's nerves to think much of his moral character. But after this long absence he saw plainly that Joyce was deteriorating rapidly. The company he had been in this very night proved it. If there were any truth in the saying that birds of a feather flocked together. "'Hello, Stephen,' said Herrick, taking off his coat. Why did you not go to bed, man, sitting up all alone like a maid, on the eve of St. Agnes? I did not want to go to bed until you came home, said Stephen. You know I always like a chat. Have some whiskey. Thanks. Shove over the tobacco jar. Well, Marsh, I have arranged about the sale of my practice. It is all right. I am delighted. You are sure you do not mind giving it up? Not for a thousand a year, replied Herrick with a laugh. I never made so much in all my medical life, not to mention the delights of your society. What have you been doing? Shopping, mostly. Then I called in at Firth and Firth to talk about business. I heard of your friend Joyce there. The deuce you did, said Jim, wheeling round. I have just been dining with him, and I do not think he is improved. Firth and Firth are his lawyers, I know. How did his name crop up? in the course of my talk about the colonel's business. Herrick stared. What do you mean? he asked roughly. Well, you will be rather astonished, continued Marsh, lighting his pipe. But the fact is, Colonel Carr allowed Mrs. Joyce, the mother of your friend, an income of five hundred a year. No, said Herrick, and thought that this was just the sum Robin said he had been left by his mother's will. Yes, why, I do not know nor could Firth tell me. The Colonel never called to see Mrs. Joyce, and he never wrote her a letter. But he directed Firth to pay her an annuity of five hundred pounds. An annuity? Then it ceases at her death? Of course, the son gets nothing. The reason Firth mentioned it was that he wished to know if I had found anything amongst my uncle's papers likely to show why the annuity had been paid 
and whether it ought to be continued to the sun. Queer, said Herrick. He remembered that Robin had told him that he had interviewed the lawyer and had been informed of his income. Why had Robin told a lie? I suppose, said the doctor after a pause, that Firth did not take it upon himself to promise Joyce the continuance of this annuity? Certainly not, replied Stephen. He had no right. Of course I told him that I knew nothing about the matter, and would not pay anything to Joyce. Still, as he is your friend... Never mind that. I don't want you to pay him anything. Did Joyce call to see Firth, do you know? A week after his mother's death, he has not been since. They told him then that he need not expect any more money. A week after his mother's death, related the doctor, and it was two months later when we were on that walking tour. Did not Joyce call to see Firth somewhere about the 24th of July? No, it was towards the end of April he called. He has not been near them since. You look rather pale, Herrick. It's nothing, replied the doctor. I have had rather a turn. That's all. End of chapter 8